This is Creating Your Encore Career and Becoming a Silver Entrepreneur with your host, Lynn Freest. Lynn will share ideas and expert advice from people that are walking in your shoes and living their encore careers, where they want and at the pace they want. You'll start a company of one with confidence and knowledge to live a fulfilled life of freedom and ease. Lynn is a coach and leadership consultant whose mission is to show senior leaders and experts how to start something refreshing and new after a full career in the corporate environment. Welcome to this episode of Creating Your Encore Career and Becoming a Silver Entrepreneur. Thanks for listening. Well, with an encore career, the rewards are better than a cold beer on a hot day. And you could be creating value in the world beyond just winning that next pickleball game. You can work when you want, or you want, and you can do the work you love. You can live the dream. And if you're ready to get started today, please contact me at lynn at lynnfreas.com. This is episode 185, and it's Developing as an Entrepreneur, a conversation with Chris Lomia. Chris is founder of the Trusted Toolbox, which is a home repair and projects business that he started down in Atlanta, Georgia. He says he started the company because he and his wife had a to-do list that kept getting longer while their time kept getting shorter. Chris is also the author of the book, From the Zoo to the Wild, Your Guide to Entrepreneurial Freedom and Wealth. And he also hosts the Small Business Safari podcast, again, talking about what's it like to be an entrepreneur. Chris's company is focused on processes and training to deliver home renovations. And really, he talks about his employees as being the artists in the company, and he wants to help them show off their talents as they do their work. So he's got a great idea there. So some of the things we'll talk about are his journey as an entrepreneur, how he's developed his company, both his book and his podcast, and what are the things he's working on next. Well, welcome, Chris. Thank you much for being on the podcast, but just to get started here, I'd say you've got your own podcast. Could you tell us a little bit about what you talk about there? It's got its interesting name. Oh, thank you. Yes, the Small Business Safari. My name is Chris Lalami. I'm my co-host, Alan Wyatt. The Small Business Safari is really about my journey from the corporate world into the small business wild world of running your own business. And what I try to do is impart some of the lessons learned that we had from the rumbling, bumbling, stumblings that I've done and try to uncover some gold nuggets to give you ideas around if you want to make that leap into small business ownership, what's it look like? And if you're in it, what's it like to scale? Because getting bigger is not always better. Getting better is better. And a lot of us, especially in the field I chose to go into, to get bigger, you need people. And to scale that, there's a lot of people challenges, but just a lot of challenges in general with running your own business. So that's what we try to do. We have a good time, lighthearted, try to do edutainment, educate people while they're having a little bit of fun. So go check it out, the Small Business Safari. Great. Maybe you could go ahead then and explain. I know you've got the Trusted Toolbox and there's just several facets. So what's your journey been as you got all this stuff started? So I, uh, long story longer, uh, I'll make it quick. So I got my master's in mechanical engineering, went to manufacturing, always wanted to run my own business. So I went to work for a company called Accenture now, which was Anderson Consulting. When I started with them, it turned into Accenture. Got to work in banking. Uh, Went to work in banks and helped uh, a lot of mergers and did a lot of behind the scenes processes and merger integration. Eventually got one of those jobs that everybody covets. I had 400 people working for me, pretty young age. That job with the Mercedes and the custom suits and all the trappings that looked really great. And then I just looked up one day and said, man, I hate this. I want to go out there and start my own business like I said I was going two years ago. So I started the Trusted Toolbox. It's a remodeling and handyman company now, but I started as a handyman company in 2008. And if you remember what 2008 was, that's right. I started it right before the recession. So timing is not my best thing, but I was able to persevere, get through that. Today, the Trusted Toolbox, we have 40 employees in the metro Atlanta market. We do everything from punch lists around the house, drywall repair, fixing wood rot, all the way up to basements, bathrooms, kitchens, and uh, deck remodeling. So I have two divisions here. And then I've opened another office in Athens, where University of Georgia is. It's about an hour and a half away from our office. Mm -hmm. And I've also started another company called the Home Service Institute to help train other technicians in the home services world around customer service skills and the soft skills around there. So we got a lot going on, but I've got a great team behind me doing all this stuff. So I have a chance to come out here and talk with you. Oh, great. Yeah, and that's it's intriguing, too. You got started in engineering, and you end up now 
getting your trusted toolbox business going on. I likewise am an engineer, but I spent 40 years with John Deere in engineering and manufacturing. So I now I'm out trying to help people make that next step in their careers after having spent my year in manufacturing. So, uh, Well, that's an incredible company. I'm very familiar with John Deere because I was a mechanical engineer because I rebelled uh, because all I did was work on houses as a kid. My dad was a civil engineer. I rebelled and became a mechanical. And so here I am back now with my general contractor's license working on houses. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, it's always interesting how we go into different things and whatever intrigues it. And I think from my perspective now with the Encore career, I think everybody should be looking for what is it that lights your fire kind of a thing and try to make some different choices. So you made obviously a big shift going from helping bank mergers and stuff like that to the trusted toolbox. What are some of the first things that, I don't know, roadblocks you hit or first, I think a lot of it is sometimes mindset, but what are the first few things you ran into as you started that transition? So the big thing for me was I'd taken some time. I was very thoughtful about leaving, not because I'm thoughtful. It's because I came home in 2006 and told my wife, that's it. I'm out of here. This is it. She's like, whoa, 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 Sparky. We got a lifestyle. You got a nice job. You better have a plan. So I worked on a business plan for the hint for this, the Trusted Toolbox. It took me about six months. I had a couple of other businesses I was pursuing and thinking about doing. So I launched in April of 2008. Uh, off I go. Sold my Mercedes. Got two white vans, put myself in one of the vans, started as a handyman, eventually became the sales guy and and going. But you want to talk about roadblocks every day. Every day you wake up, I'm solving problems. So the big headwind for me in the beginning was the recession. Um, I figured handyman business would be relatively recession resistant. And it was. I was able to grow through it. But what happened was the mindset. If you were involved in that time, if you had a home in that time, everybody was impacted by it. And your buying decisions, your dollar value, making that purchase choice really came down. Mm -hmm. So that was my first roadblock. People are always going to be the biggest part um, to find good handymen, to train them, to have them do it your way. I would say today we're doing it better than even when I only had three and four guys because of our training that we do. But there's been a lot of hiccups and a lot of bumps. And why does every bump and every learning always cost you so much money? I don't know, but I sure seem to find those. Yeah. Eventually some upside happens, but it does. It's not a straight rocket path up from what I've heard. (laughs) It definitely is not a rocket path. Everybody thinks it's a linear path and it's more like ups and downs and ups and downs and flats and plateaus. And then you feel like you got there and then you get right knocked right back down. What are the things that you found helped you the most, either through your background or education or whatever it was? What are the things that helped you get through this? My business plan was probably the biggest thing that helped me in the beginning because I didn't just build a business plan to have an A paper as if I was going to school and trying to get out of school and get a get the English department to give me an A paper on this. I actually used it as a opportunity to engage mentors, engage people who are smarter than me and ask questions of them. And that document has always been a living document for me. In fact, I still have it in my office. Still, it's in a red binder, continually gets updated. Now it's a little bit different plan, clearly. That helped. But I felt like my toolbox that I had built up, to use the trusted toolbox analogy a little bit more, I felt like I had my tool set uh, that I had put in my box. As engineers, the one thing I learned when I went to work in banking was we don't think like other people. And when they asked me what my skill sets were, as well as precision metrology, machining, and they're like, no, 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 I think it's more about problem solving, linear thought process, the ability to break down big things and make them small things to create smart answers and solutions. And you're like, oh, yeah, I guess that's what engineers do. (laughs) So that helped me a lot. Sure. Yeah. And I'm sure given your background at Accenture and stuff like that, the business plan, a lot of times people jump into these things. I'm a good whatever. I'm a good engineer. I'm a good supply management person. But they don't really understand the business part. Sounds like you. that was a leg up that you you had for you. The reason I actually went to Accenture was either I was going to go back and get a business degree because one of the things I was very proud of after going and getting my master's in mechanical engineering, I only took two business classes. And I was very proud of that. And then when I went to work, guess who all my bosses were? People with business degrees. And I realized I knew nothing about business. So I could either go back and get an MBA or go out there and learn business. And I went to, at the time, I felt like Anderson Consulting, it was one of the best consulting firms. And I learned a lot about business, about what it takes not only the financial aspects of business, but the people, the management, the ability to be inclusive with your teams and start to work with people who aren't just engineers. 
or just machinists or just manufacturers. Yeah, absolutely. I often in my career, I worked a lot in the front lines of manufacturing and I think half my job was to translate from the engineers to the frontline supervisors and help them each understand the language of the other because <laughs> they were very different. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> and I'm sure you you even face that today as to how you explain to whether it be homeowners who think they know everything or or whether it be in other situations where, yeah, you have to kind of translate and help people understand some new new perspectives, if nothing else. Always. Yeah, both sides of the coin, you know, employees and with the customers. Because I'm in the handyman business and are, we are the largest handyman here in the organization in Atlanta, we deal with a lot of homeowners. I've got 15,000 homeowners over the 15 years that we've worked for over the years. Last year, we worked for 2,800 of them. And everybody's different. And you're in a very personal space, right? We're in people's homes. Their number one asset, the place they raise their children, the place they call home, the place that, that's their domicile. So when you go into there, there's a lot of translation you need to do because you have to realize you are invading their space and their time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it, as I've come to see a few more years on me, I, I will now freely say I can't do a lot of things or don't want to do a lot of things. And yet I could imagine when I was a young homeowner, I tried a lot of stuff and made a lot of expensive mistakes in that learning process. <laughs> A lot of us do. I was the same way. In fact, when I first started the business, I joked about this with my team today is that I was the DIYer. And that's why I did this because I could work on houses. But my drywall patch took me all weekend uh, to patch some drywall in the house after doing a repair. I'd start on Friday night. I'd go to the kids' games on Saturday morning. I'd come back. I'd put the second coat on. we go to church on Sunday, come back, do the third coat, let it dry, prime and paint it, go back to work on Monday. Mm -hmm. Today, my guys are able to do a drywall patch that I just did and can do it in about two and a half hours. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's always the experts are really worth having, <laughs> to be sure, on those it is. things. It's a time and value thing. Again, when we were young homeowners, we had more time than we had money. And now we have more, a little bit more money than we have time. In fact, one of the guys just joked, I said I was leaving to go back to the house. They go, you're not working on it because we know right now your toolbox is using us. I'm like, that's true. <laughs> as you, even as you got started, I know you started out in one of the trucks. But at a certain point, I'm sure there were aspects of the business you decided you needed to have other help on. What were some of the things you decided that you needed help on as you developed your business, for example? That's a great question. I developed a functional org chart when I first started. And I actually wrote a book. It's called From the Zoo to the Wild, My Journey. And it's called From the Zoo to the Wild, Your Guide to Entrepreneurial Freedom and Wealth, available on Amazon. Shameless plug. But anyway, I developed a functional org chart. And you'll see in that book, I filled every box except one, which is where the other technician was. But my first hire was somebody to start answering the phones and starting to organize me as I was out because my next step was to go into sales. Because when you start your business, there are two things you need to have. One is sales, but second, and that's the almighty big one, that's cash. So cash flow is king, but you got to have some sales. You got to get some customers. And that's what I was out. I quickly transitioned to the sales mode. Yeah, and for sure, we'll include links and stuff to your book because, again, I've just skimmed some of the work there, but sounds like it's a fascinating way to, again, help people understand what's it take to move into this entrepreneurial mindset and work. Yeah, I don't think it's the only book you put in your library. Obviously, I, there's some great books out there. I, it's But what I've been told, I'm getting a lot of feedback on it. It's been out now for about a year and a half, is that it's a good weekend read. It's a good, easy read for people. And that's why I wrote it. I wrote it for somebody like me, who right now is a little time starved but still likes to read books, but I'm not really ready to dig into a, a Shakespearean novel. I want to have something that I can read, pick up a few nuggets, and then move on and be entertained. And mm -hmm. so hopefully it'll be entertaining for you. <laughs> Great. I was trying to think too, since you have several facets to your business, how do you go about allocating time? Because sometimes, again, people who I talk with in the Encore career, they talk about a portfolio life. In other words, they'll have two or three different interests they're pursuing. One will be a business, but the other may be volunteer work. The other may be a passion project. How do you sort out your time with all the different things you could be doing? That's another great question. I actually have an accountability group that I'm part of. Once a month, I get together with other business owners and they challenge me, lack of focus. Why are you not just focusing on your trusted toolbox business? And I said, for example, the podcast for me is akin to somebody who maybe wants to play in a band and you like doing music at night. This is a chance for me to get together with one of my buddies, have a couple of beers and get some great conversation going with people. Uh, we do it every couple of weeks. So I feel like they challenge me to get back and get focused. But 
it definitely has taken a lot of time because I was very focused on the Trusted Toolbox for the first, well, probably for the first 10 years where I was solely focused on this. It's only been as of late where I've got a great team in place now that can run the toolbox for me. In fact, they often tell me that it runs a lot better when I'm not with them because I'll come into the call center and say, oh, you guys want me to help answer some phones? They go, it's okay. I think we got it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's an important piece is while you were developing yourself and your business, it looks like you moved right ahead then and started developing others. So what were some of the things you found as far as success factors that help you quickly develop others in the in your business? So I love leadership. I, I do, you know, everybody jokes that sometimes your worst thing is having to have employees when you have a business. And I've joked as well, you find a business where I don't have any customers or employees and I'm there. But uh, truth be told, I, I do enjoy leadership. I love watching a bigger team solve a problem. Back to the engineering mindset. I love watching diverse opinions come up with a better solution than my own. The hard part, especially as an entrepreneur, is is giving it up because mm-hmm. this is your baby. And uh, it took some time. And I had to learn and put the right metrics in place to know that they were doing things the way I hoped they'd be doing them. And I was very intentional in the way I built my culture because you have a culture in your company, whether you know it or not, whether you're intentional or not. And you got to understand what your culture is. And I feel like for better or worse, I know what my culture is. And there's a lot more better than there is worse. And that's allowed me to do stuff like this because (laughs) this having this conversation with you allows me to sit back a little bit and talk and I get more energy. So when I get back engaged with them tomorrow, it's going to be a lot more fun because I'm just more energized. So I find that you've got to find your, because this is a grind running your own business. It's hard. Don't let anybody ever tell you it's not. If you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you'll see I, I take a lot of vacations now. I have a lot of fun, but you don't see a tenth of what I'm doing because the rest of it is a lot of hard work behind the scenes. Sure. Yeah, that's the the everyday, the haul in the water is still has to be done, even though it, it looks like fun later on. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, I love that one. Whereas my I had cousin who was a farmer and he said, yeah, there's sometimes we bring in the harvest, but there's also a lot of days where we clean out the barn too. That just is part of <laughs> how things are. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, well, yeah, talk about that. Talk about a tough job, farming right there. That's that's one right there. You could do a lot of analogies on that. But that's a tough business. Yep. Uh, so as your other business uh, where you're, again, trying to help others become entrepreneurs, what are some of the things you've noticed from people you've worked with or feedback you've gotten as you've, uh, through your book or other things? What are some of the things that the new entrepreneurs are telling you or running into? That's a great that's a great point as well. I, I love getting the feedback because I am finding there is a mind shift, mindset shift. And I keep, I'll bang this drum until I'm done. And that is, you've got to have a business plan. Not for you, but for your business. You really got to think about this. This is not, again, just an academic exercise. This is something where you got to think about how are you going to go to market? What makes you unique? How are you going to market to them? How are you going to get those customers? How are you going to develop that customer into a customer who's going to pay you what you were worth. And then how are you going to deliver that service or that goods that you're going to do? I'm finding a lot of people now, they want to be the Instagram star. They want to be the social media star. They want to, they want to, they want to see it be a little easier. And I'm not saying they want everything easy, but I think they want to skip over a few of the steps that I do think that's going to make a big problem. I had somebody share with me on my podcast that there are 11,000 businesses started in the U S every hour. <laughs> Let that sink in. Wow. 11,000 businesses started every hour. Yeah, one in 10 makes it. Yep. One in 10. So you want to be one of the one. And that's what I put in the book. If you want to be the one that sit, that survives, it, 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 there is nothing sexy about some of the work we have to do. And that is just blocking and tackling and doing the right things on the upfront for marketing all the way through service and taking care of your business and knowing your numbers. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, one of my passion projects is I help our local entrepreneurial group put on what they call a venture school, which is the lean startup process. And we just, we start again next week, but it's always the first part of it. We spend almost solely helping these young people that want to start a business. How are, You got to go out and talk to customers <laughs> and you need to talk to almost a hundred of them before you even start saying very much more about your business. So that's that like you say, that work that needs to be done up front, but it really decides whether or not you'll be succeeding. Because you may have the what you think is the perfect idea, but it doesn't survive your first meeting with a customer. 
It doesn't. I, it's, I I've got a great example of one. I created a thing called the home maintenance program here at my company, and that's providing a service to customers on a, a biannual basis where we'll come out and do an inspection and do some handyman work. And it's the home maintenance program where we keep your program up to date. Mm-hmm. I developed it about 15 years now. I developed it 12 years ago. I still haven't rolled it out. Um, <laughs> so why? Because when I was rolling it out, it was in the middle of the recession. Nobody wanted to buy it. And so I right. shelved it. And we're actually thinking of resurrecting it this year. Yeah, yeah. There, And sometimes it's just like you say, it's timing. You may have a great idea that will sell. It just won't sell this year kind of a thing. Absolutely right. I mean, and, you know, I love that you're working with young people, too. I go back to the high schools here and talk for career day and challenge everybody. I don't care if you're 16, 17. I don't care if you're 37 like I was when I started. I don't care if you're 67. I don't care your age. You just need to follow these things if you want to be successful because it doesn't change. You just don't happen into this. You just don't fall into shape. You just don't happen to lose weight. You just don't happen to learn a skill. You don't know. You just don't happen to learn how to play the piano. You have to practice. You have to delve into it. You got to put those hours in to make it happen. And that's what I really challenge any young person I ever talk to is that a lot of this stuff, again, it's not sexy. You just got to do it. It's not just on your phone hitting a couple buttons posting a picture somewhere. And next thing you know, everybody's going to throw you millions of dollars to be an influencer. <laughs> yeah. And then I think as I've got some expertise, just as you do, and we want to carry that forward, but there's always something I, I can learn. And just this morning, I was talking to a young lady who's doing some social media stuff for me. And she said, I've looked at your stuff and similar things, and you need to, you're telling people how to do something, but you don't spend enough time telling people why they should do it or what was your journey? And I said, ah, a very good insight. You're right. I've been more of a, an explainer rather than helping people say, why would I want to do this at all? So it's, I, and that's the little secret of helping these people on these little startup programs is I do learn a lot from them, even though I'm quote, helping them during that time. I love that you do that. You, you're probably very similar to me. When I talk with young people, I actually run a summer series called the Summer Entrepreneurship Academy mm-hmm. here in Atlanta. Usually a couple of kids are working for me during the summer as helpers. And then I picked up a number of others. But I found that every year I do this, I get more than I give. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get a lot of energy. And I did actually I pick up an intern. And you're right. They've helped me with my social media, my presence out there. On Instagram, I'm actually, I've been on TikTok, believe it or not, but Instagram and Facebook are the focus for the social media for not only the Trusted Toolbox, but for me, Chris Lalamia and my brand and my book and the Home Service Institute. And they're, you know what, they're right that just getting out there and preaching isn't really going to work anymore. You've got to be educational, but you also got to have a lot of entertainment, have a lot of fun with it. And people will get the message. And I think that's a big thing that all of us need to learn. How about this? This old guy right here needs to. (laughs) Well, same here, because this young woman just started doing this work for me. And just this morning, my wife come and said, have you got somebody helping with your Instagram posts? (laughs) I said, yes, I do. (laughs) Because she noticed right away there was a different, the style was a little better and more upbeat and stuff like that. that. It's funny you should say that because I was just at a networking event last night for the National Association of the Remodeling Industry at we have a chapter meeting here and I'm on the board and I walked in and I, I had more, I had no less than five people come up to me and say, oh, I just love, you know, they feel like they know me mm-hmm. because of my Facebook posts and from my Instagram posts. And that's all really a combination of me doing a little bit, but me also having my intern help me out, who's not back at school, but helping me out. And when I go back and look at it, he just really accentuates my personality, mm-hmm. does a great job of getting it out there. But that's, you'll find that you're going to find more and more people saying that to you on that. Yeah, I'm sure. And it's the concept I know because I've been told it a long time that people are, they don't buy your product, they buy you. And that's always been true. And yet sometimes we get so busy doing things, we forget that, (laughs) that uh, I'm really selling who I am, not just what I know. That's that's a great point. That's what I put in my book too. I always want to, I want to bet on myself. Uh, And in the corporate world, sometimes especially when you're up for a promotion, you're counting on other people to get you the promotion. You're not in there being able to pitch yourself. You're not being able to, you're always selling yourself. I don't care what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're a kid in Jackson, Michigan at 17 years old, working in a machine shop, trying to decide if you're going to go to college or not. You're always selling yourself. And that was Mm me. And I learned that then. And that it's not that you're always a salesman, but you're always selling yourself because you're right. I'm going to buy you. 
I'm not going to buy your product. I'm not going to buy your company. I'm not going to buy John Deere just because the best green out there and it's the best looking thing. And when they're out there selling those tractors, they're buying the names, put their name in there, but they're buying the guy in front of them going, look, this is why you want this. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I can't agree more because it's it's always interesting. And, and some of these things don't work the way I necessarily thought of. For example, I have a good friend who teaches people how to do podcasts. And he said, you know, Lynn, I said, I only got 100 some people a week listening to my podcast. He said, okay, Lynn, how many times in the past have you stood in front of 100 people every week? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> but, yeah, and, that's great. And more importantly, had them listen to you for a whole half hour or something like that. And I said, yeah, probably zero. But uh, so it's, we always compare ourselves. I don't have 100,000 downloads, but maybe that's okay. <laughs> yeah, but if this podcast, just if somebody picks up one gold nugget out of something we just talked about right now, and it was at the right time, you, you have no idea the impact that you may have had in that multiplication effect of having that impact, just doing this. I've heard that as well. Oh, there's so many podcasts out there. I'm like, yeah, there's also so many radio stations, so many TV stations. There's a lot of noise out there. But if I get my message through just to one person and they don't make the same mistake I did, then man, I feel like that was worth it. No, absolutely. People say, well, there's so many people teaching leadership out there. And yet, what's the common complaint that people have? Nobody knows how to do leadership. So, yeah, <laughs> it's not like there's not plenty of work. <laughs> Exactly right. You can always learn. And like you said that earlier. So if you're not learning, you're dying. If you're not learning, you're not growing. You're going to learn from the time you start. And if you continually learn, you'd ask the question, or maybe I'll phrase it differently. What makes a successful entrepreneur? I think number one, uh, you've got to be tenacious. You got to be a problem solver. Number two, you have to be optimistic. Number three, but you've also got to be open to listen to other people and mm -hmm. keep learning, always learning. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because people are changing. The world is changing. Technology is changing. So you really, the, you never have the final answer in today's world, much less as, certainly not as an entrepreneur. There is yeah, not, not for very long final, either. No, not a final answer. You always have to keep innovating. Yeah, I agree. So as you look forward, what are some of the things that you're planning to do next? What's exciting you for you coming up? I've got a lot of great things going on. The Trusted Toolbox, we're actually looking to double our remodeling capability this year. Big challenge for us. I think I got the right leadership team in place. I think I got the right metrics in place. Uh, came out of January, didn't exactly hit our goal, but they know what they got to do to hit, get it back on February. So I'm excited about that. Our Athens branch continues to grow. I got a speaking opportunity later in March to go talk about customer service and why it's so important in the home services space to get out there and do that. So I'm excited about doing that. So a lot of great things are happening, getting the Home Service Institute, getting a few more clients involved in subscribing to our videos and our process, the way we do the training. So right now where I'm at, I'm pretty excited about 2023 because I pick a word of the year for our company. Uh, and last year, our word was your attitude reflects your altitude was our word. But this year is going to be finish because mm -hmm. being focused on it. We had a great year last year in our revenue. So my vanity line was really cool. You know, hey, Chris, how much you do? Oh, man, I did $5 million. I, I, I did, oh, I did whatever. But, hey, uh, nobody ever asked, how much did you bring home? Oh, let's not talk about that. That's my sanity line. And I didn't have that much sanity last year because <laughs> we made a couple of mistakes. Some things bit us in the butt. Didn't have the right people in place. And here I am 14 years into it and still making tweaks and changes and solving problems. So this year I'm looking for a much more profitable year so we can get a few more trucks on the road and do some other things that will be great for the company and the image. Yeah, I was just visiting with a friend of mine the other day who was also an entrepreneur, and he he was saying he had people focus on what's your margin? Your gross is nice, but a lot of people, he says, just keep building the gross, but they have a small margin, so they're really just working harder. <laughs> and it's he says that's not necessarily sustainable. You have to pay attention to what that margin is. Absolutely. you got to know your numbers. That's why I, I, coined, I didn't coin the phrase, I stole it. Your vanity line, hey, that's how big you look, but your sanity line is how much you're making for all the juice you're striking. Are you getting all the juice out of all the squeeze? Sometimes, I would tell you, man, after 15 years, it's been up and down, up and down, up and down for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that is another good thing for people who are going to be entrepreneurs is that, like we talked about earlier, it's not linear. It's there are going to be ups and downs. So you have to have some patience and some grit to stick with it. And Always be, re what's your plan B is you, whatever happens externally. Absolutely. I would tell you, there's more than once have I been on the couch at 3.30 in the morning, curled up going, what have I just done to myself and my family? What am I doing to myself? And at seven o'clock, I'm getting up and 
just checking boxes, solving problems, getting through the day and got to keep that tenacious optimism. You've got to solve those problems and you know what, you can get out of it. But don't think we haven't all been there. And it's hard. It's hard. And I had somebody on my podcast and I would say, when should you have stopped your business? And when you did stop your business, I would say the lag is usually about a year mm-hmm. if you're, because you're just so optimistic that you can turn it around. And we've talked to a lot of people, either the pandemic or in the recession, that just the business has had to pivot. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. that's When to say stop is also an important thing. It's one of those things. There are a lot of opportunities and what's going on externally may not reflect what the possibilities are for you. I think you've mentioned that during some of those downturns in the, quote, bigger economy, you actually were able to make some progress because, again, what you were offering was important to people. Yeah, I think this is a great time. I know a lot of people are trying to start businesses now. And I would say it's always a good time in the headwinds or when things are down because it makes you for it forces you to be lean, you to focus on your process, focuses you on what you need to do to niche down to get where you want to be. And then when the economy came back for me, which it did, the theory that all the rising tide raises all ships. And I think I had my ship a little higher and it was able to really propel me. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. The And I think two of the, you know, my demographic or the folks that are my peers, I think the pandemic, since it disrupted our whole lives, it made a lot of us rethink, okay, what do we want to do going forward here? And, you know, in today's world, whether we are thinking about it or not, we're tending to live longer and live healthier longer. As you reach 60 and quote, retire, you could have another 20, 30 years of doing something. And what would that be? I say in my podcast intro, you may not want to just win the next pickleball game every day for 20 years. There might be something else you're interested in. Yeah, that's why I encourage people to find out what that something else is. It may be volunteer work. It may be work for pay, but whatever, find out what that might be. Yeah, I said the same thing. Somebody says, are you ever going to retire? I said, I can only play so much golf in a week, man. So (laughs) you you said pickleball, I'll say golf and the same thing. And I, I truly believe that is that I've had a number of different careers as it were manufacturing engineer, a process consultant, then running the trusted toolbox. I think I have at least one more in me, maybe even two. Sure. Oh, absolutely. And we may decide they have different elements to them as we go later on, but nonetheless, and I just use this in another call when I was talking to somebody today, my mother, who's 96 now, she had a friend that was in her later 90s. And this friend said every year she had a project. And so she passed when she was 98, but the project that year had been, she was going to learn Italian. It's one of those things. I think we we all need to keep projects in front of us, whatever they may be. Bellissimo. That's beautiful. (laughs) Yeah. As an Italian guy who has not learned Italian very well, I've taken a couple stabs at it. That's definitely on my list. Okay. I sure want to thank you, Chris. This has been a wonderful conversation. I've appreciated it. And we'll include your contact information, the links to your book, those kinds of things in the show notes. Any final thoughts you'd like to give people who are thinking of an encore career or a second career? Yeah, I'd say don't let people tell you no, but make sure you have your plan. Make sure you got it down because you'll never have it down. And guess what? People like to give you information. And don't be afraid, even if they think they're going to be a competitor, don't be afraid to go talk to them. That was something I didn't do because I was afraid that if I they knew I was coming, it would be bad. And now when people come talk to me about starting a handyman business, I'm like, sure, come on in, have a seat. Let's mm-hmm. talk about it. This is really flipping hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's harder. It's going to be harder than you think. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. Thing. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Again, thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity and look forward to maybe hearing, collaborating more in the future in some fashion. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, thanks. I enjoyed talking with you. Well, again, many thanks to Chris for sharing his knowledge, insights, and wisdom. We talked about his journey as an entrepreneur, how he has developed his company, his book, and his podcast, and all of these things we'll have in the links in the show notes so you can check them out later. And finally, wrapped up with what are the things he's working on next. Again, with an encore career, the rewards are great. You can be creating value in that world beyond just winning the next pickleball game. You can work when you want, where you want, and you can do the work you love. So if you're ready to get started today, please contact me at Lynn at lynnfrias.com or sign up for the email list and we'll give you notices of other things that are upcoming. Thanks for listening.